we have a very special we have a very special guest tonight, Dr. Peter Senior, um, who is an endocrinologist and leading expert in diabetes care. Um, Dr. Senior will be talking about complications related to type 1 diabetes and how to stay healthy um, over the long term. More importantly, he is going to be answering all the questions, specific questions you have about this topic. Before I introduce him, I wanted to provide some background about the session itself. Um, like every huddle, we're going to be videotaping the event, as you heard in the background. Um, and the reason we do this is so folks who aren't able to attend at this time can actually watch the recordings from our website or on Spotify at any time of their convenience. Um, to make sure that the session runs smoothly, um, uh, we really have one ground rule. Only one person speaks at a time, so please be respectful of one another. So this is a record setting session. Um, we had over 96 people sign up and, you know, we never have 96 people show up, but um, this is the most well-subscribed session. So, um, and I think it has to do with our guest. Dr. Senior is an endocrinologist and professor of medicine known for his expertise in type 1 diabetes, islet transplantation, and diabetic kidney disease. Um, he leads the clinical islet transplant program and is the director of the Alberta Diabetes Institute. Um, Dr. Senior's clinical practice involves caring for patients with a wide range of endocrine disorders, um, while his research focuses on conducting clinical trials for new diabetes treatments. Currently, he serves as the chair of Diabetes Canada's board of directors and previously served as the chair of its clinical practice guidelines, steering committee, um, and its professional section. With a passion for advancing medical knowledge and improving patient outcomes, Dr. Senior is a well-respected leader um, in the field of endocrinology. You know, on a personal note, I have met with and I've worked with so many endocrinologists in the United States and Canada and probably all over the world. And, and while many acknowledge mental health as an important component in diabetes care, um, Dr. Senior is one of the few people who I feel truly understands it. Um, in fact, several of our huddle members have shared um, stories, um, really positive experiences being cared for by Dr. Senior. So um, it's a testament to um, his reputation. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Senior. I think he's going to do a brief presentation overview, and then um, we'll follow by the questions you submitted. And feel free to, on the fly, submit questions in the chat box as well. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tricia and friends and uh, colleagues. I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm very flattered that uh, you're interested to hear some of my thoughts and, and opinions. And um, this may be the gospel according to Peter at times, but I think this has been grounded hopefully in evidence and hopefully grounded in, in sort of reality of clinical practice as well. So I thought just to get us all on the same page a little bit, I thought I'd talk a little bit about complications. I think everybody will have heard about them, worried about them, read about them, been threatened by them from time to time as well. But there are, I think, a number of common misconceptions. And I think just by trying to explain what things mean and how they work, that, that may be helpful for the discussions later. Um, so this is a slide taken from the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, which was the study which showed that sort of good glycemic control was important to reduce either the development or the progression of complications of diabetes and type 1 diabetes. And on these two figures, we have got the um, HbA1c on the x-axis and then the risk of complications on the y-axis. On the left-hand panel, you've got retinopathy, so eye disease. On the right-hand panel, you've got microalbuminuria as a proxy for kidney disease. So there's two things I want you to notice here. One is that the shape of the line is not straight. So if you look at the top here, if your A1C is 11%, your risk of progression of eye disease is quite high. If your A1C was 5.5, it's very low, but it's not a straight line. And essentially, if you go from 11 to 9, there's a massive reduction in risk. But going from 7 to 6, 
it's a lot of effort with a lot of risk of hypoglycemia, but your risk for complications doesn't go down that much further. So we don't aim for an A1C of 5% because the, the investment is not uh, worthwhile. The other thing I want you to notice is that for kidney disease, there's also a curved line with high A1C associated with high risk, but the, the shapes of those lines is not the same. And I think what that implies to me is that glucose is an important driver of both of those things, but there may be other factors needed for kidney disease, which perhaps you don't need for eye disease. Okay, and we may come back to that as we go on today. Um, sorry. This is a, a figure I used to teach the medical students and making the point that high blood glucose levels for a long period of time predicts risk for eye disease. And that I think is fairly obvious to most people. What you may or may not know is that there's some weird things as well, however, because if you have a rapid improvement in your blood glucose control, it can make eye disease worse in the short term, although in the long term, it's an advantage. But it's not just glucose that drives eye disease. Uh, high blood pressure will drive it also. There's some connection with blood lipids, and it's actually triglycerides, not cholesterol. And then there's also influences of hormones. So certainly during uh, puberty, that seems to be a time when retinopathy can develop because of all the hormones in puberty. And then for those who want to get into the real minutiae, in the olden days, before we had laser, one of the treatments for bad, bad, bad retinopathy was to do surgery on the pituitary gland and make people growth hormone deficient because growth hormone seems to promote uh, eye disease as well. So these are the factors for eye disease. For kidney disease, we see a lot of the same factors. So we see blood pressure again, we see high glucose for many, many years, but we actually see far more other factors. So smoking, gender, metabolic factors such as obesity, and then family history are very important there. So just making the point that while glucose is the sort of the common link between all of the complications of diabetes, there may be important other uh, metabolic and genetic factors that contribute. So let me talk you through a little bit more detail about eye disease. So this is a very, very complicated slide and I don't have the uh, animations that I sometimes use, but let me walk you through it. I don't know if you're able to see my mouse, uh, hopefully you can, but if we start up here with high blood sugar levels, that activates a, an, an enzyme called protein kinase C, which seems to turn on damage in the cells which line the smog blood vessels in people's eyes. That can lead to proliferation of cells trying to repair the damage. The supportive cells which support the blood vessels can be lost as well, and we get thickening of the basement membrane. That's not so very important other than to say that that's exactly the same process that's happening in the kidneys. Okay. Now, the damage to the small blood vessels in the eyes can take you down one of two pathways which show up differently to the eye specialist, they show up differently to the patient who's affected, and they may influence the treatment that people need. But let's go down this left-hand path first of all. If you've got damaged lining ce cells, lining these vessels, it can mean that the small blood vessels get blocked, causing back pressure, which leads to swelling and bulging of the blood vessels, a bit like if you had a kind of weak spot on your car tire, you might get a bulge out of the size. And that shows up as little red dots that we call microaneurysms. If you get lots of capillaries to get blocked because of these damage to the blood vessels, the retina becomes ischemic. It's not getting enough oxygen. And when the retina is not getting enough oxygen, the nerve fibers, which are normally see-through and transparent, they get swollen and puffy and they actually do become cloudy. So they're no longer see-through. And so when you look in the eye, it looks like little spots of cotton wool. So if you see cotton wool spots, you know that the retina is not getting enough blood supply. 
Now, when the retina is not getting enough blood supply, it sort of tries to fix the problem by secreting this hormone called VEGF, which stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. So basically, this factor causes new blood vessels to grow. And on the one hand, you think, oh, awesome, more blood vessels, more blood supply. They're not very good blood vessels. They're weak. They're spindly. They grow in the wrong direction. They grow in the wrong places. And they can easily pop. And they bleed. And it means that the jelly in your eye gets filled with blood and you can't see. And we call that a vitreous hemorrhage. So people might wake up one day and think, I can't see out of one of my eyes because it's filled with blood. The other thing that these little spiky spindly blood vessels do is they can sometimes grab onto the jelly in the eye and contract and they pull the retina off the back of the eye and that's a retinal detachment, again, leading to an acute loss of vision in one eye. So if you have this problem, these problems on the left-hand side, we can treat this eye disease with laser treatment. Now, this is what we call panretinal photocoagulation. And actually what we do is we do lots of laser burns around the outside of the vision field to preserve the, the part of the eye that reads straight ahead. And what we're actually doing is we're killing off dying retina because if the retina is dead, it's no longer ischemic, it stops making VEGF and these blood vessels will then sort of just you know, shrivel up and die. We're not actually zapping or cauterizing these blood vessels uh, when this is the problem here. If we go down the other side, if you've got damage to the small blood vessels in the back of your eye in the retina, they can get leaky. So rather than sort of keeping blood, blood in the blood vessel, it leaks out. And then you get protein and fat exudates or coagulating in the back of the retina. And we can see these as what we call hard exudates. The problem here is that you can get swelling in the retina. And if there's swelling in the retina, it means your vision's not quite so sharp. There may not be very much to see if you look in, but if you test somebody's eyesight with the, the letter chart, their, their vision is not as good as it was before. And here we may use laser to zap the leaking blood vessel. So it may just be one or two burns, and that will then allow the, the kind of the, the fluid and the swelling to settle down again. So it sounds a little bit like Austin Powers when we talk about laser treatment, um, but there are actually some new treatments which have become, or they've come available and very effective. So laser is effective, but it's destructive. It destroys retina. Injections are a bit more subtle. They don't damage the retina. They deal with the problem. The difficulty is that they need to be repeated uh, on a regular basis, perhaps monthly. Let me shift gears to talk about kidney disease very briefly. So the kidneys do two jobs. They get rid of bad stuff. That's the creatinine, the waste product in your blood. But they need to hold on to good stuff, things like protein in the urine. And so those are the two things we track when we're trying to look for kidney disease. And what we're often doing is that we're looking for urine albumin, sometimes called the albumin to creatinine ratio or microalbuminuria. This is where we can detect small amounts of protein in the urine above normal. They may come and go and come and go, but then become permanent. And the reason that we look for microalbuminuria is that it's a bit like the check engine light on your car. It says, hey, trouble ahead, potentially, you need to get checked out. Because if this becomes persistent and is not treated, what we then find is that both blood pressure rises and there's a progressive fall in the body's ability to get rid of the toxins. And so the creatinine levels rise, EGFR levels fall, and ultimately that can be associated with kidney disease. The good news is that we've got treatments that are effective for slowing that progression down. And if we see microalbuminuria here, maybe 10, 15, 20 years after diagnosis, we'll start various treatments to stop this falling down. And we want people's kidneys to last, last them a lifetime. Uh, and this is an illustration of that. Let me move quickly, because I know you've got questions, and talk briefly about nerve damage. 
I think the way that nerve damage and diabetes can show up for many people is, is often in one way or another way. On the one hand, the thing we, which we often hear about is painful peripheral neuropathy. This is tingling, burning sensations in the hands or the feet, mainly in the hands, often worse at night. People can't stand the bedclothes touching their feet. They sometimes have to have their feet sticking out of the bottom of the bed. That can be very, 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 very distressing for people. Um, on the other hand, sometimes I worry less about it because I'm not worried that they're going to damage their feet without noticing. Their feet are like super sensitive. The other problem that other people might face is the issue that they lose sensation in their feet. Now, they rarely complain about that because, well, what's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is if they get a rock in their shoe or they step on a thumbtack or something like that, they can be damaging their feet without realizing because they don't have that warning symptom of pain as a protective uh, feature. And so we sometimes call this distal symmetrical sensory neuropathy. My joke about neurologists is that all they ever do is explain things in Latin and they call it a diagnosis. So often these are just long words to say, describe the symptoms in medical words. But the way that I think we might best understand this is that if you have high blood sugars for a long, long time, it will damage neurons. Some of those neurons will eventually die. And if you've got dead neurons, you, you won't feel things anymore. You'll, your feet will be numb. But while the neurons are damaged, you may get increased sensations of pain or burning or these other unpleasant symptoms. And it's partly because some nerves, their job is to sense pain or temperature or whatever it is there are other nerves whose job is to say to the other guys hey calm down don't overreact to this and if you lose those calming nerves which say don't overreact then the ones that do react to pain and temperature they start firing off and telling you you've got pain or burning even when you don't and if any of you have ever needed a root canal done that pain you get is you've got your tooth is actually dead, but it's the other nerves are sort of not calming things down a little bit. I, I may not be explaining that as well as I should, but uh, let's move on in, in view of time. Uh, and the reason that neuropathy is important is that because you don't feel pressure, pressure can build up in the feet. The pressure leads to thickening of the skin. The thickening of the skin further increases pressure on the foot. The pressure on the foot in impairs the blood supply and you can get breakdown of the skin to form ulcers and there's lots of things going on here but really it's, it's about neuropathy predisposing to ulcers which could then be infected that's that's really what we're worrying about here but the other thing which i know has come up in questions is the parts of the nervous system that control the things we don't think about breathing digestion swallowing um, all of those things are under control of the nervous system, and we call it the autonomic nervous system because it's somehow automatic. So if people have got neuropathy from diabetes, it can affect the new autonomic system. And we sometimes find that people's heart rate runs a little bit higher when they're resting, but doesn't go high when they exercise. They may be unable to regulate blood pressure, so they get dizzy and lightheaded when they stand up. We can have problems with erectile dysfunction. Some people will never sweat. Other people will sweat when they're eating bread. So delayed gastric emptying, bloating, feeling full halfway through a meal is a suggestion that there's delayed gastric emptying, which is what gastroparesis is about. And then some people will end up with quite bad problems with either constipation or with diarrhea or both uh, because the regulation of kind of the lower intestines is, is dysregulated as a result of nerve damage. So I'm going to stop there, um, but I wanted just to provide some background as to, to what I, or how I think about these complications, which I think, at least I hope, will be helpful to have us all on the same page. Okay, great. I'm gonna start with the pre-submitted questions, which are categorized. Um, the first category is T1D complications, general questions. Um, Maureen and an anonymous person asked, uh, does aging automatically mean complications even if well-managed? 
why do some people with diabetes get the um, horrible or kidney eye and, uh, and eye complications while um, other people with type 1 don't? Okay, so I think I would start by saying this, this is all to do with rule three of diabetes, which is life is not fair. So people who've you know, worked really hard to look after diabetes, they have got good A1Cs, and they still get complications. And then there's other people who seem to have you know, been fairly carefree about the diabetes, maybe not paid so much attention, and nothing bad seems to happen to them. I think with all complications, there's degrees of severity. And I think one thing which I was alluding to earlier is that diabetic eye disease is a glucose dependent problem. And if you look really, really carefully at people with diabetes who've had diabetes for 40 years, everyone will have something in the back of their eye. It might be one tiny little red spot that does not matter. But 30 or 40% of people will develop what we call you know, sight-threatening retinopathy that needs some treatment uh, to stop it in its tracks. And so there are probably genetic factors which contribute to this 30 to 40% of people who seem to get proliferative retinopathy that needs laser or injections. Those are the people who seem to get kidney disease. So kidney disease has got this much bigger genetic component. And again, people who get kidney disease and type one diabetes, they're the ones who get bad retinopathy. So there's some sort of common genetic factors. So yes, glucose is gonna be the grease that greases the wheels, but there's other factors too. And so it's, it's not inevitable. Um, and we have people who've lived more than 60 years with type 1 diabetes and, and haven't had complications. And I think one of the other questions is that, you know, let's say you're at 60 years of diabetes and you haven't had any complications. Are you going to get them now? Almost certainly not. So we rarely get complications, surprises with complications. People who I've met and worked with who have problems with blindness or other things like that, we could see this trouble coming 10 years down the pipe. You know, these were people who we hadn't seen in clinic for years. They hadn't been having their checkups and things like that. So I often joke that if, you know, the engine rusts and falls out of the bottom of my car, it's not because I miss one oil change. On the other hand, you know, there is definitely people who, who are unlucky. And again, I'm sure we all have friends and neighbors who, you know, were healthy and then had a heart attack or died from cancer, and never smoked. So there's things which we don't understand, uh, but I think my own view is that sometimes complications get overplayed. Um, and I know, Trish, you'll know Bill Polonsky. I mean, his favorite question is true or false, diabetes is a leading cause of blindness, amputation and kidney failure. And you know, everyone says, well, it's true, isn't it? And you say, no, no, poorly controlled diabetes is a leading cause of those problems. Um, and he would go on to say, you know, well-controlled diabetes is a leading cause of nothing. And I recommend that for all of my patients. Um, that's a good quote. I'll have to tell Bill, I heard it from you. <laughs> um, and you did, you did answer uh, the question. Um, the second one, I'm still going to ask. Oh, actually, you know what, Maureen, did you have any follow-up for Dr. Senior? I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Okay, so the next question, Dr. Senior, are Wait, we alluded? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't unmute. So, so if I have late and autoimmune diabetes, so I've had it for 16 years now, and I have some complications, probably because the first um, 12 years I was treated as a type 2. Um, so can they get better? Like, will, can my kidney function improve? So kidney function, if you're talking about kind of the glomerular filtration rate, the ability to get rid of creatinine, it generally doesn't sort of get better. I mean, if, if you know, you got dehydrated over a hot weekend, your creatinine would jump up, you rehydrate, it comes back down again. But I think generally, if you've lost nephrons, if you've lost the lost filter units from your kidney, those, those won't come back. They won't regrow. But again, if we keep you stable, again, they, they should yeah. last your lifetime. Okay. I think the, the comment about being diagnosed later in life, 
I often say there's never a good time to be diagnosed with diabetes, but there are worse times. And again, for people who are diagnosed in their 50s or 60s or 70s, you know, they're not going to live with diabetes for as long as somebody who's who gets at the age of 10. You know, you, you know, we're, we're all moving towards our finish lines. Um, but, it, you know, complications from diabetes are really quite that long term play. It's, it's a decades in the making, by and large, which is good and bad. Yeah. OK, thanks. Pleasure. OK, um, this is from Anonymous. I've had type 1 for 52 years now, um, and now I'm 65. My A1C has been between 7 to 8 my entire life. I have, I have not had any complications due to my type 1. Um, should I expect them now? So I think I think the short answer is no. Um, it's, it's if you've survived this long, you're a survivor. Um, we will get your genes, we'll squeeze them out of you and we'll give them to all the other people who've got complications. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, hard work and effort uh, together with, with good genes and a bit of luck, that sounds like where you're at. But, you know, I just don't expect you to, to, to be developing complications at this stage. I think, again, there's always exceptions to every rule. I wouldn't say never go back to see the eye doctor. Because again, that's one that, again, you may not, you know, don't rely on symptoms to detect these complications. You know, let's do the checkups just to be sure. But I think the anxiety levels, I think I'd be saying, don't worry so much about those at this stage. I often say that diabetes is, you know, we sing from the same hymn sheet, tight control, tight control, tight control. But actually, when you get to the bottom, there's some really small print that says, please turn over. I need to turn over, it says, don't don't have too many lows because that actually becomes a problem with people with very long standing type one diabetes. Okay, um, that person, would you like to follow up if you submitted that question? All right, next question is from Michaela um, and anonymous. Can type one affect energy levels even if you are well controlled? I often feel more tired than um, when I was younger. Yeah, I think that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think tiredness is something that's not unique to diabetes, is not unique to people getting older. Um, there's lots and lots of things that could be related. I think, you know, I don't know if you've kind of had the experience of where everything gets blamed on your diabetes by either friends, colleagues, or most commonly by medical professionals. Um, and I, again, it's one of these things that feels a bit unfair because, well, what am I going to do about that? So I think if people are running with blood sugars in the teens and 20s, a lot of times they're going to feel tired and fatigued with that. But but even those with good control, I mean, I do worry at times or wonder whether it's just the burden of diabetes day in, day out just burns you out and wears you out. And that might be more of the factor rather than anything sort of biological as it were but I don't know that I can give a very definitive answer to that okay Michaela if you're here would you like to follow up okay next question is from Stephanie I took a diabetes educator course a few years back um, and it told us that 100% of people over age 80 don't feel their lows anymore um, is there anything we can do now to keep that awareness up or is it inevitable um, they also give seniors a uh, higher A1C target to account for this. So I think there's, so I think I would disagree with the original kind of advice. Not everybody has hypoglycemia and awareness. The hypoglycemia awareness, essentially you've got a glucose thermostat in your brain. And if your blood sugars are used to running in the teens, you know, you, you will feel symptoms of low blood sugar when your blood sugar goes down to eight because the thermostat is reset too high. If you're somebody who's been running really tight and you have lots of mild lows, the thermostat will reset set itself down. And so your blood sugar can be down at 3.1 or 2.9, no symptoms at all. So hypoglycemia is something that I worry about a lot. Um, and if you get no shaking and no sweating, and the first thing you know that you're feeling low is that you're getting a bit confused or people are saying, are you okay? That's, that's really important to know about. You can reset the thermostat back up. 
the mistake that you often hear said is that if somebody's got reduced awareness of hypoglycemia, people say, oh, you need to run your A1C high. That's not true because the A1C is an average. What you need to do is you need to have nothing below four for about six weeks. If you have nothing below four, because you're really very careful to be checking, testing promptly, being aware of situations where you could be low, not delaying treating a low, taking preventive action before you go for a walk. If you get your blood sugars out above four and you keep them there for six weeks, you will see an improvement in your hypoglycemia awareness. I think there are exceptions. People who've had tons and tons of severe, severe lows for years and years and years, those thermostat cells may be kind of dead and buried. And, and we can't get them fully back. But, you know, I think this sort of, I meet a lot of people, so I say, well, I don't need to worry about those. The ones, that, if I have a low in the night, they always wake me up. They're wrong. Only the ones that wake them up, wake them up. The ones that they sleep through don't wake them up. And we know that people sleep through lows quite a lot. So I think avoiding hypoglycemia, paying attention of thinking, hey, am I getting the same symptoms that I had five or 10 years ago is really important. But again, if you work hard for a period of time to just avoid that hypoglycemia, you'll find that the warning symptoms do improve and that's very clearly established. Stephanie, did you want to follow up on that question? I know you have two, but I just wanted to give you a chance to follow up on question number one. Um, no, that, that helps put it into context. And um, it's good to know that that thermostat is something that can be reset regardless of your age, because it was so dire. Like they really, I was really shocked that they said 100% of people over 80, just they made it sound like it was like, you don't secrete the same hormones any longer. Therefore, we're adjusting the A1C target to be higher. But what you said makes more sense. If you stay out of the low zone, then you can recalibrate and become sensitive to sensing them once again. Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank you for clarifying. And I, I think, you know, just to kind of further emphasize that, you know, you know that I work in the Isle of Transplant Program, that predominantly we're treating people who have terrible lows with no warnings whatsoever. And we've, what we've seen very often is people, you know, they've had their transplant, they have got, you know, just really no lows for years and years and years. And then maybe they have a problem with their transplant and it stops working. They may be back to insulin, but they're like, hey, my warning symptoms are back. And they're so very appreciative because of course it's a safety net. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Question number two from Stephanie. Looping is saving my life, but I worry about running out of viable skin to use for absorption and using the technology required as I age. We don't know what the technology will be like in 30 to 40 years, but if it stays the same, how do lower cognition people manage the devices and treatment recommendations? Well, so there's probably at least two questions mixed up there um, or included there, not mixed up, that, that sounded bad. But um, I think the real estate thing is an issue. Um, you know, pump bumps, was, was used to be the phrase that we used to talk about with infusion sets. I think there has been investment in developing technology again to make infusion sets more tolerable, last longer, not need change quite so much. And I, I think hopefully that will mean that, you know, the real estate issue will be a little bit less. The same, however, is true for kind of finger sticks uh, and even just insulin injections, because again, people would sort of just that have just gazillions of injections over their whole lifetime. So it, it is, you know, it, it's something that we should not ignore. I think, you know, doctors will say, oh, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. But actually, there are some people where it does become a problem. Um, you know, I think, I think it's reasonable to expect that actually things will improve and get better um, you know, for example, there's a once weekly basal insulin that's being developed right now. And one of the adaptations is it's seven times more concentrated. And you could imagine a pump system where if you're giving something that's seven times more concentrated, now we're not going to put a basal in a pump, I know that, but just reducing the volumes, reducing the size of the device. What if we had micro needles that actually didn't sort of sit under the subcutaneous tissue? So I'm hoping uh, that, you know, miniaturization technology 
even if there's not the breakthrough of a cure, we'll be able to deliver insulin more conveniently. The question around the cognition is an interesting one because I think for the longest time, pumps were really, they made the biggest difference in people who had the capacity and the cognitive skills to manage it. We're now moving towards this phase of automation where actually you don't need to be thinking about this all the time. You don't need to be doing mental math to calculate the bolus. And that I think is quite a dem democratic kind of thing because it opens this up as a very useful option for people who you know, maybe traditionally we wouldn't have thought about. But we have faced more than a few problems with people you know, with type 1 diabetes in their 60s and 70s and beyond with cognitive impairment from dementia. You know, once upon a time, we never worried about dementia and type 1 diabetes because nobody lived that long. And again, good news, bad news, I don't know. It's good news that people are living long enough to get dementia. But certainly, you know, they're often struggling to use their technology. They've been fiercely independent and effective at self-managers managing their diabetes. But now they're in a situation where they're relying on other people for their health. Those people don't know how to use pumps. They don't know how to prescribe insulin very often. Um, and so sometimes we are actually kind of taking people off pump systems and putting them on, again, some of the very, very effective basal insulins and simplifying things. Because again, if you're 85 with a bad heart in a nursing home, really we want to be focusing on quality of life and maybe not aiming for another 20 years. Um, so we, we need to, I guess, be able to adapt to this. But a big, big worry I have is about nursing homes who are used to treating type 2 diabetes, assuming they can take the same approach to people with type 1 diabetes. And I, one of my patients today, I was finding out that they're on four shots a day and they're lucky if they get one blood glucose test a day in the nursing home. And yet, you know, how do we dose the insulin based on that? So I think cognitive function is a challenge um, and one that we don't, you know, we've not really addressed yet. Okay. Stephanie, did you want to follow up on anything from that question? Great. All right. The next question is from Jackie. In addition to standard complications, can Dr. Senior expand on autonomic problems? Um, like you had, I think you had a slide on this, um, gastroparesis and what, if any, diagnostic or treatments are possible? All right. So I, I started off my kind of research career in diabetes complications, and we always used to sort of say, well, diabetes complications, they're the, the Cinderella of the diabetes world, because everyone's much more interested in mechanisms and treatments and starting new drugs and things like this. Among complications, neuropathy is the Cinderella, and among neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy is the, is the Cinderella of those ones. And I think neuropathy can be really, really, really devastating. And I had a clinic last week where neuropathy was the dominant feature for, for two of my patients. And it was just breaking my heart, really, because, you know, I could see the pain, the distress, the huge impact it was having. And yet I had so little to offer. Now, maybe if I met these people 20 years ago, I could have changed the direction. But, but, but I didn't meet them 20 years ago. So gastroparesis, you know, this the sort of classic test is, you know, oh, let's do a nuclear study. So we give you an egg salad sandwich made with an egg from a radioactive chicken. And we then scan your belly to see how long it takes for the stomach to move the radiation in the egg out of the stomach into the intestines. And, you know, residents and lots of doctors love to order these, these scans. And you're like, awesome, your gastroparesis is really terrible. And, it, and the patient says, well, so what are you going to do about it? Oh, we don't have any treatments. Um, we just did another test. And so my own view is I, I actually rarely order the testing because I'll, I'll, I'll find out if people have it based on their history. And so I'll ask, you know, do you feel full halfway through a meal? You, know, you start off feeling starving, then you know, halfway through, oh, I couldn't eat another bite. If people are throwing up, you know, this morning's breakfast or last night's supper unchanged, you know, they've got gastroparesis. There's, there's no doubt about it. 
And we do have some drugs that we can use to help move the stomach on. Domperidone and Maxaran are the ones that we reach for first. There's probably a better one called um, Prucalopride or Rizotran. It's not covered in Alberta on the provincial plan. And, and I would bet it's not covered in BC because BC covers even less in Alberta, apart from Dexcom. Um, so autonomic neuropathy is challenging. And, and very often it's just trying to work out how we manage this symptomatically. So postural hypotension, I had a lady this morning whose blood pressure is kind of 130 when she's sitting and when she stands up it's 70 and she feels dizzy and lightheaded and falls over and has broken various bones along the way. So there are some drugs we can use that make people retain a bit more fluid and keeps the blood pressure up, but that has some problems. Um, we can sometimes recommend support stockings uh, to again help with that sort of fluid retention or the sort of fluid sting closer to the heart. But sometimes it's just very practical things about, you know, take your time to get up. If you feel dizzy and lightheaded, please sit down or lie down before you fall down. But, um, you know, uh, avoiding them is, is clearly far, far preferable. And uh, they can often be very, very difficult to, to manage and have a huge impact on people's lives. Okay, Jackie, if you're here, um, would you like to follow up? Okay, um, your second question had to, has to do with uh, coverage, and I, I know that Alberta and BC have different coverage, so if you'd like to put that in the chat box for someone else to answer, that'd be great. Now we're moving into our second category, aging. Um, Sharon Jiv says, what things does a person who's in their mid-30s and who is already keeping in um, great control should be concerned about with regard to aging? That's a, I mean, maybe I'm at a certain age where I need to reflect on this myself, but um, I, I think this comes back to, you know, more complications are, are often used as a motivating factor for people with diabetes. I don't like doing that. Fear and greed are, are strong motivators, but the fear is one that motivates you sh for a short time. And I think living life, enjoying life, focusing on relationships, those are the things which will bring joy. You know, we need diabetes to be in the appropriate place in people's lives. You can't ignore it because it'll bite you in the behind. But if you spend your whole time looking after your diabetes, you're missing out on the other aspects of life. So it's just, I think, keeping that balance. So again, I'm going to tell you, don't start smoking, but look after your mental health. Don't drink too much. Keep as fit as you can. But again, don't become a nut about it because you'll just annoy other people. Um, but but be, be who you are. I joke sometimes in the adult transplant program that we, we don't do personality transplant. You're you. Um, be the best version of yourself that you can be and and again if you can have diabetes be something that helps you make healthy choices rather than something that you live in fear with that's the approach that I would try to to take but I often say to people please look both ways because although your blood sugar is in good control and you're not going to go blind it doesn't mean you won't get knocked down by a truck and killed so please look both ways before you cross the street you're not superman Okay, great. Sure, Jeep. Um, if you're here, would you like to follow up? Okay, next question comes from Ed. It's pretty straightforward. What is the longest anyone has lived with type one that you know of? I I am pretty sure there was a lady, I think, and she was brought out on stage at the American Diabetes Association a few years ago, who'd had type one diabetes for about 82 years. Um and again, that's pretty impressive because she must have been like just like first in line at banting in the best to, to get the infant at that stage. Um, it is kind of intriguing, though, that some of the people who've had dives for many, many decades, they're a bit weird. And so Bruce Perkins has studied many of the people who've had dives for more than 50 years. Quite a lot of them still make some of their own insulin, which, again, runs counter to what we often think. But uh, I think 
again, type one diabetes isn't just one thing. And I think there's different sort of flavors or varieties, if you like. Um, but if, if any of you um, beat 82 years, congratulations in advance, because I may well be retired or buried by the time you get there. Okay, great. Ed, if you're on um, screen, would you like to follow up? All right, the next question is from Anonymous. Does a person's daily insulin gradually increase, insulin need, I'm guessing, increase as you age? So the short answer is no. So generally speaking, people's insulin requirements stay stays fairly stable through life. The things which change it are things like pregnancy, when it really, really goes up. Um, weight change will, will make a difference as well. So if you gain a lot of weight, your insulin requirements will likely go up. In um, With kidney disease, insulin requirements will go down. So if you look at somebody who starts with, say, kidney function that's normal, and then, I know, 20, 30 years later, they've got kidney function, which is quite diminished, not bad enough for dialysis. Their insulin requirements might be down to about 50% of what they were before. And I think as people get older, into sort of old age, uh, where you're kind of really slowing down, you're not eating quite so much. Again, insulin requirements go down later, and you know, very, very late in life. But there's not this kind of relationship that, you know, number of units should equal your age plus you know, 10 or anything like that. Generally, it's relatively stable if the weight is stable. Okay, great. Um, Anonymous, if you're there, would you like to follow up? Okay, next question. We're actually moving into cognition. What is the current evidence for how hypoglycemia affects brain health? Part one, do low blood sugar events from the past, especially losing consciousness, affect your brain health as you age? Okay, great question. And I, I probably should have started at the very beginning, like with a trigger warning. So I'm really, really conscious that things that I'm talking about, you know, may affect some people here. And again, I don't want to be adding to people's worries. I think for a long time, doctors and researchers would say that, well, you know, that there's no evidence that that hypoglycemia causes, you know, you know, problems with cognition. And I think this was one of those things that, you know, it's kind of like, well, we don't want to tell people things which might demotivate them from looking after blood sugars. So I think blood sugars and cognition or cognitive function, we know that people who run with high blood sugars, they have cognitive impairment later in life. And again, sort of related to damage from the high blood sugars. I think people who have too many lows, maybe an accumulation of severe lows, I think that does cause impact as well. Now, it's been hard to study because who would you study? Um, you know, how do you find people that you know what the diabetes has been like over the last 50 years and then study the brain and sort of try and connect dots between, you know, that event that happened when they were 14 and where they're at when they're 65? But, but I think there are some clinical observations which are very, very illustrative. So I can think of a, a young man who I met when I was a resident, and he had had very profound, profound severe hypoglycemia, who was sort of semi-conscious, barely conscious for several days. And when he woke up, he essentially had the mental age of a sort of six-year-old. So it's clear that the acute severe hypoglycemia had caused brain damage for him that, that, that we could see in this way. The other thing which I've observed over the years is that I'm working with people with type one diabetes, they've had it for decades. And I'll make some comments, so I'll say when I talk to the nurses, I think they've just had too many lows over the years. The cognition's a bit slowed down, sometimes language difficulties. And again, it may be some specific defects in terms of either executive function or some other aspects rather than everything. And I think the other thing we sometimes see this is that people seem to be doing very, very, very well, but then they sort of have a, an apparently very rapid decline in, in cognitive function. So that it seems to the outside world that they've got this very rapidly progressive dementia. And I just think that they've got a vulnerable brain 
from this cumulative damage over the years um, that then is sort of easy to just tip over the edge. So I think we're after the Goldilocks level. You know, we don't want too high. We don't want too many lows. We want somewhere in the middle. And again, I think the thing which has broken my heart a number of times is that, say, in the Islet Transplant Program, people have worked so very, very, very diligently to avoid microvascular complications, but they've had too many lows, and that's showing up with cognitive decline. And so I think as time has gone by, it has become clear from the data that too many lows can cause cognitive impairment. But again, it's the, it's the tightrope that people with diabetes walk every day. Today, I don't want to be high, but I don't want to be low. I don't want to have DKA today, but I don't want to have cognitive impairment tomorrow. And I think it, we need to be really careful about the burden we put on people by threatening them with all of these things. And if you do this wrong, you do that wrong, you'll get all these terrible things happening to you. Ultimately, we all just have to do our best. Okay, the person who submitted that question, um, if you're on screen, would you like to follow up? I'm not sure if 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 humor is allowed, but I was just going to joke and say, you know, that'll be if they remember if they asked the question. Um, <laughs> that was a joke, just in case people people didn't realize. Well, I laughed. Um, Thanks, the next you. question is from Teresa. I was diagnosed five years ago at the age of fifty six. Will this make a difference and of how aging impacts my body systems, especially my brain? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, as I said earlier on, I think if you get diagnosed with 56, I'm not really worried about diabetes causing cognitive impairment for you. If you ha have cognitive impairment, it's much more likely to be related to Alzheimer's or other factors like that. But, you know, you've got, you know, 52, 54 years of advantage on some people who are diagnosed with diabetes and have lived their whole lives with it. So, I mean, it, it's frustrating to be diagnosed or misdiagnosed with type 2 for some time. That's a very, very common complaint I hear in my, in my clinic. Um, but I think, again, the later in life you get type 1 diabetes, probably the better. Okay. I may and not feel like it at the time. Um, are there any studies? This is a follow-up question for Teresa. Are there any studies that have been done on type 1 and dementia? I think... Probably, yes. I, I know that there's been some discussions about kind of cognitive function in the diabetes control and complications trial follow-up, but it's, uh, and there's a, a researcher in Seattle called Earl Hirsch. He's been talking a lot about this recently, but I think it's an area that's ripe for study because again, as I said earlier, we haven't had to worry about it too much before, but it's something that I think we do need to, to think about in more detail. Okay, Teresa, if you're on, would you like to follow up? Okay, I'm going to go into retinopathy. Um, if you get eye shots of Avastin for retinal swelling, is that forever or will it eventually, um, can you eventually stop the injections? Yeah, so it, 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 I think the answer is that it will stop. It may depend on why you're having it. So. You know, I talked about this kind of proliferative retinopathy with bleeding in the back of the eye. That was the dominant problem in, in diabetic retinopathy for many years. But with better treatment and with lasers, that's becoming less of a problem. But what we're seeing now is this diabetic macular edema and the swelling. And, and lasers not so good for swelling, but the injections are good for swelling. And the injections, in fact, are good for both the bleeding and for the swelling. And what generally happens is that, you know, you need these injections monthly, but as things settle down, the injections can then spread out and then stop. But this is sort of the, 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 the downside in some ways of the injections that it needs to be repeated. Now, again, I may be sounding a little bit political here, but, you know, something that you have to repeat every month, if you're the doctor billing for the service, you know, maybe that's not a problem. From the patient perspective, maybe you'd prefer the one and done kind of treatment. So um, I, the expectation with retinopathy in general is that it's often sort of bad for a while and needs a lot of work and treatment, but then it seems to settle down and then stay quiescent after that. 
So it may just be that there's going to be a period of months or years where there's quite intensive treatment, but that same frequency of intervention, I don't think it will persist indefinitely. Okay, the person who asked that question, um, would you like to follow up? Okay, we're going to move into neuropathy. Can neuropathy affect your heart? Yeah, so <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system so controls adrenaline and all those kinds of things so this we often talk about the sympathetic nervous system which sort of stimulates adrenaline tends to speed the heart up and then we have the parasympathetic nervous system which calms it down and, and slows it down and what we find is that you know let's say a healthy person their heart rate might range between let's say 60 when they're resting and it could go up to 160 when they're you know running on a treadmill or trying to run away from a bear um but people with long standing type 1 who've got autonomic neuropathy we often find that their heart rate will range between like 90 and 120 and you know that may not matter although some people will find that their exercise tolerance isn't quite so good um, it may be that their ability to perform in running is not as good as it was in the past. And there is some thought that it might be, I guess, associated with sort of abnormal cardiac rhythms. We know that people with diabetes have a higher risk for heart disease than people without diabetes. Um, but again, you don't have to have diabetes to die from a heart attack. But if somebody had, say, a cardiovascular event or they, they had a cardiac death, it may be difficult to know, well, how much is the neuropathy or how much is sort of vascular disease blocking the plumbing? Um, but th there is, I think, some reason to believe that it may predispose to some of the cardiac problems. And sometimes we may choose to use uh, beta blockers which is sort of older fashioned blood pressure drugs, they tend to slow the heart rate down, keep it under control, and um, they may be protective in people who've got bad autonomic neuropathy uh, affecting the heart. But again, it's one that may not make you feel any better while you're taking it. Um, and again, not one that's been easy to study. It's more been extrapolation, I think. Okay, um, we're hitting seven o'clock, but um, Dr. Senior, can you, would you be able to stay another 10 minutes to finish For up sure. the questions? Okay, great. Sure. So next question is from Carol, and I think I saw Carol's name. Um, has there been any correlation with nighttime leg cramps and diabetes? Well, only that all of my patients ask me about it, and I say, I don't know what the link is. Um, yeah, leg cramps, again, very unpleasant, very painful drive you nuts um i have them and i don't have diabetes sometimes so you know i, I don't know that there's a very clear co collection connection people talk about calcium people talk about magnesium but i'm not sure i'm really persuaded that there's anything that's definitely the, the explanation but again if somebody on the call has better advice that that's that's fine i'll listen carefully okay carol would you like to follow up uh, that seems to be the answer I'm hearing all across the board, um, full of magnesium and all those good things, but it, I, I do find it interesting. It's like, I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, it does seem like it could be anything talking to any number of people. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to know if, if you went to a neurology clinic or some other disease clinic, like, you know, would they begin to ask the same questions? Um, I'm not sure that I think it's really is necessarily connected with endocrinology. I mean, certainly people with low calcium, they get spasms in their muscle, but I don't know that that's what's going on in diabetes. Yeah, fair and enough. So. Yeah, I know I had uh, two toes that were kind of numb for a while and went in for testing for that. And uh, Oddly enough, I went in for a massage and my masseuse found a little bone that was kind of tweaked and she popped something in and voila, I could feel again. So it had absolutely nothing to do with diabetes. <laughs> well, 
you know, and this is, you know, the comment about everything should die be died. I'm going to get a poster made to show the resonance, you know, where, you know, you've got the arrow through your head and the doctors, they're saying, oh, that'll be your diabetes <laughs> causing a headache. I mean, it drives me nuts. So I think it's really important that we don't assume everything is diabetes because we don't want to miss the, the other problem, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the last question for neuropathy is from Anonymous. I'd like information about diabetic neuropathy of the throat. Is there any new information or treatment? I'm not, I'm not sure if I know what autonomic neuropathy of the throat is. I mean, I think reflux, difficulty swallowing, there's a condition called achalasia where the kind of the gullet doesn't have things going down. I mean, again, I think it's that all of the mechanisms which sort of move food through the intestinal tract can be upset by diabetes. Some people will be the kind of esophagus, others it's the stomach, others it's lower down. Um, but I don't know that there's anything new um, other than to say that all of these things can be affected and, and that we often reach for the same drugs to try to stimulate the, the nervous system to kind of contract and, and move things through the system better. Okay, um, the person who submitted that question, uh, would you like to follow up? Yes. All right. oh, go. All right. It's um. I've had this issue for five years, and I've been tested by you know gastroenterologists and everybody, and I have this constant feeling that there's something stuck in my throat, but I can swallow. I have no issues with swallowing, and I have this throat clearing and this horrible taste in my mouth. And I've had many doctors trying to figure out what it is, but it's, it's the yeah. last one said it's maybe neuropathy of the throat but i can swallow so <laughs> yeah i think the the we hear people sort of complain of this sort of sensation of something being stuck or not being able to swallow properly even without diabetes so i see quite a lot of my thyroid clinic people have gone to the doctor saying well i've got this weird sensation and they then get an ultrasound scan and oh your thyroid's enlarged and they come to see me and we fix the thyroid and then say, so but I still have this problem. Yeah. So it's one that's often unexplained and not unique to diabetes. I, I don't know that I would blame the neuropathy if you've got, don't have those other problems. That's right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. doc doctors are better telling what you don't have than what you do have. <laughs> They've tried. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now I'm moving to the chat box. There is just two questions. Um, uh, this is from Suze, and Suze, I know you're here because I saw your name. As, um, are type 1s more prone to blood clotting issues such as pulmonary embolisms and strokes due to diabetic vessel damage um, or other factors? So I don't think I believe there's any increased risk for pulmonary embolism. So these would be clots in the veins side of things. And really, we think of diabetes mainly coming, causing problems with arteries. Um, stroke disease, again, is a little bit like heart disease. So if you think about damage maybe from high blood vessels and sort of high blood sugars on the lining of the blood vessels, that damage often causes cholesterol to move in. You get thickening of the lining of the blood vessel and blockages. So I think that's really why strokes are more common in people with diabetes. Um, uh, along with perhaps a slightly higher rate for bl high blood pressure as well. But I think I think blood clots probably not. I mean, the exception might be if you're admitted to hospital very sick with a blood sugar of 40, you know, your, your blood is like maple syrup. And in that set setting, you might have a high risk for having a blood clot. But in sort of day to day life, I'm not sure that I think of somebody with, you know, if somebody comes in with a deep venous thrombosis too, or a pulmonary embolism, I don't think, oh, I wonder if they've got diabetes. It's just, I'll look for other things in the hematology. Um, and there may be more genetic factors more than anything else. But uh, I don't know that I would blame diabetes for venous blood clots. Okay. Suze, did you want to follow up? Okay, now the last question in the chat box that looks like a question is, do massages or lotions help keep the skin areas happy? And this is when you were That's giving your talk question. about real estate. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So the I, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the feet first. So we often talk about foot care and you know 
then people say, well, what is that? If, you, if you've had diabetes for a long time, and there's some nerve damage to the feet, you may find that your feet don't sweat and the skin can get dry and quite cracked. So keeping the skin moisturized, soft, supple is really, really important. I think in terms of kind of injection sites and real estate and things like that, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if if sort of more sort of proactive care of skin and moisturizing massage might not be helpful. But again, it's one that most of us don't have time to think about. You know, getting the insulin in, in that that's enough for for many people, and then they're trying to get on with life. But um, I think keeping the skin moisturized and looking after the skin is probably something that we underemphasize and is underappreciated. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's a great answer, but that's the best I can do at this stage of the evening. Okay, um, Carol, did you want to follow up? Okay, great. Well, you know, we made it under the adjusted time of 7.10. Um, I want to thank Dr. Senior for being our guest expert tonight. Um, again, I think we're so fortunate to have someone like you um, willing to just speak for, you know, an hour and answer questions. Just it, you know, I think a lot of times in BC, people, um, you know, live in areas where they don't have access to endocrinologists or people that they can ask questions to. Um, and this is one of the opportunities and having you do it is kind of like a superstar. <laughs> You're a celebrity endocrinologist, essentially. So thank you so much um, for um, being our guest speaker tonight. Um, and um, hopefully we will have you in the future. Did you, did you have any last comments? Peter. Just to say, you know, thanks for the invitation. I, I hope that what I've said has been helpful and, um, and and again, just sensitive to the chance of living with diabetes. It, it just it's a lot to do minute by minute, day by day. And then this kind of long term dread about what might be around the corner is a lot. And, uh, you know, I'm just conscious that I don't want to add to people's burden by creating alarm or worry. And again, let's try to control the things we can control things that are beyond our control you know worrying about them may not help okay great so um this is going to be our last huddle for the summer i mean we're going to take a break in the summer just because everyone's traveling on vacation um so our next one will probably be in september but we're happy to receive um, any requests or suggestions on topics that um, people are interested in um i've already we've already got one today actually um so if I don't see you all in any capacity um, in the next three months, um, have a wonderful summer. Um, and but feel free to contact us if you have a question or if you need any help. All right. Have a great night.